Hello, welcome to this video guide where I'm going to talk about streaming and the technology I use and have gathered over the years for online role playing, streaming videos of technology in front of you, streaming videos of painting, crafting, or anything else you do, and the types of camera and kit that I've got in my setup, like this Lumix G from Panasonic, and how I use them and how I wire them into the computer. So there's some advanced topics in here. Um, because I sort of deep dive into all this technology, but hopefully there'll be something that you'll find in here in the way I've tuned my setup, which will be of use to you. you know, for example, I do this kind of switching between desktop where I might be doing a hobby paint guide down here and my uh, muggins in front of me here with a camera directly in front, which you're seeing now. So this kind of switching allows me to move between the different topics I may be doing. And in this instance, I've put some ideas around which I'm trying to uh, get across in terms of this video guide right in front of me to make that easier. So let's start talking about it. So you may have lots of different reasons why you want to get your video of your face or anything that you're doing in front of you down here onto YouTube or into a streaming service. Now, in particular, the role playing side of things, uh, which I'm going to focus on today, I do that with a pad and I draw out maps and various other things on that pad to enable me to share. But the most important first thing that you've got to get running obviously is to get your video into the computer to enable you to either save it or to stream it. So I'm going to start really talking about, just get this over here, whoosh, the Panasonic Lumix G7. It has what's called a HDMI output on the side here and HDMI is the standard video type of uh, connectivity that's used on all new modern um, technology like your TVs and any streaming devices that you connect into your TV and obviously your computer as well. HDMI is pretty much a standard. Now some of these DSLRs like the G7 have a connector port on the side here and that connection port allows you to plug in various peripherals and one of them being well, that's not very close in there. We'll show a close-up of it later but just as an overview HDMI in there and then how do I get that HDMI into the computer? I shall zoom down to the desk so you can see. I use what's called an Ultra Studio Mini Recorder. So go right into this so you can see the action. Uh, basically, it's by Blackmagic Design as a manufacturer, and it has a HDMI input in there, and on, on the back of it, it has USB. Now, they actually do a USB version for Windows and a, Win and a USB version for Mac, but I bought one that has Thunderbolt, which is just a, a type of interface that the Mac computers use. So this is what gets my vid video signal into the Mac desktop, and uh, that's very does a really nice job of it because it creates a presentation of that video signal as a webcam. So I'm going to do a quick sketch out in front of me of how these things wire in together and just use the terminology on there. If it doesn't make any sense to you, you can always look it up or uh, browse the uh, internet to find out more. So if I go down to the desktop, obviously uh, starting over here, I have my Panasonic G7. So that's my DSLR camera of, of choice. So that's a G7 Panasonic. And uh, out the side of that, it has the HDMI cable, which wires into the Blackmagic. Well, that's a rather small box, but it's, I put BM on there, Blackmagic. I'll write that underneath so that you know what that is too, Blackmagic. I don't know why they put Ultra Studio. Everything has to have Ultra. mini recorder. So there you go, that's the Blackmagic mini recorder as I was showing earlier and that converts the HDMI signal out of the back of the G7 into something that's USB standard. Although as I said before I have the Thunderbolt version into my Mac but USB is typical and then that would go into your desktop PC USB socket um, there we go. So typically that would be USB 2. Um, I don't think Blackmagic have yet done a version that's USB 3, so basically USB 2 out of the back into the back of your computer. 
Now, the software I use, which I've mentioned before, is OBS, Open Broadcast Studios, and that's free and available for download on Windows or Mac. And that will enable you to capture directly into OBS as a software platform because essentially this Blackmagic Ultra Studio Mini Recorder is making everything look like a webcam. So if you wanted to do something like I'm doing at the moment and recording for future upload and sharing, uh, you can do that with this technology with OBS because you can record to both disk or you can stream to YouTube or Facebook or Twitch. A whole other subject for, for this is um, different types of ways of interfacing with different streaming platforms at the same time. I won't go into that kind of level of detail, but there are services online that allow you to share um, to all of these platforms at the same time. Obviously, they don't like it. And the reason they don't like it is because they prefer to be the sort of platform of choice in one hit rather than being one that you are uh, kind of sharing across multiples they want your data and your stream on one one platform at a time but you can get around that but for this basic setup if you had a camera into the Blackmagic um, studio and then back into OBS you could record to either to disk like I'm doing right now or you could go out live with your stream just by clicking the stream button and configuring your account details because it was already set up to interface with these three uh, but it will need your account details to do that so there you have it, that's the most basic. So the other side of this, uh, which is of a little bit more interest, would be the audio side as well, and I can go through that too. So if you're recording mics and uh, getting that audio in, uh, how do you do that? Well, with uh, my setup, I'm using a system called a Focusrite Scarlet, which is an audio interface. It's not much different than a glorified sound card, really, as you used to sort of plug those into your Windows computers and do an audio output, like a sound blaster or something. That's actually an audio interface as well, but uh, an external audio interface will have more connectivity and connections on it and allow you to plug in bigger and more different um, and more capable mics. So for me, I've got a Rode Audio. I can't bring it into view here. It's called an NTG2, and I've got it on a, a kind of a boom arm. The arm itself, if you're interested, is made by a company called Shure and it connects to your desk and enables you to sort of move this into a good position. So this is by Rode Audio and you can see as I touch it, I'm beginning to make noises on there. But the benefits for a shotgun mic, as you can see, is they're very directional. You can push it up out of your way and uh, it will still sort of aim neatly down where your mouth is and get you that uh, good clear recording. The other thing is, is it's based on XLR cabling, which you'll hear mentioned if you're buying any kit like this. So it's not a standard cable, it's an XLR type, larger, chunky cable. So I'll bring it into view. There you go, you can see the back of the cable on there too. And I'll talk about where that plugs into in a moment. Just get this back into position. Try not to make too much of a racket while I'm doing it. Yeah, so I like that Rode. Um, it's a little bit more expensive than a, a standard mic or using a mic that might be connected off here, but you can keep it up out of the way. You can get it out of the frame if you like as well, if you really want a sort of professional look where you don't want the mic on show. Um, but because it's a shotgun, that sort of long, narrow um, tube there, it, it's very directional and uh, really clear for recording stuff like this. So hopefully you can hear that in the, the quality of my sound as it goes in. So in terms of how that's all connected, so there is another kind of mic you can use, which is this uh, near field kind of mic, the kind of thing you'd see on a performer on stage with it kind of right up against their mouth when they're, when they're speaking. And it's, it is a near field type recorder. So basically it's ideal for voiceover. So if you recorded something in front of you where you've done a um, hobby guide or some painting or something of miniatures in front of you, um, and you want to then do a voiceover afterwards that you record over the top, this is an ideal kind of um, technology for that because you can then put it right up to your face while you're recording and you're talking over and say, well, this is the bit where I was just about to use a, 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 an ink wash on my, on my model here. I'm using the Games Workshop contrast paints now. That's the uh, kind of thing that you can do 
with this sort of mic, not as good if you've got it at a distance um, because it tends to really go quiet as soon as it's out here. And sometimes when you see people on stage uh, as an artist gets older, they'll do this thing where they sing and as they go up to a high note or something, they'll pull it away from their, their mouth just to sort of make the, uh, the note sound a little bit more positive, that, that kind of drift away from the mouth kind of singing. And um, that's because it will go very quiet very quickly as it moves away and it's intended to pick up just that voice there and not the rest of the band that are playing at the same time on the mic. So yeah, this is a Shaw and it's called an SM58. It's a kind of a, a super workhorse. And I say I'll use that for a voiceover and I'll just plug it into the same uh, XLR connection. Um, that's the XLR connection which I showed you earlier on the um, Rode shotgun mic. So as a general summary of where we are and the technology I'm using, obviously I've got the Panasonic G7 that I connect into the computer using an Ultra Studio mini recorder that goes into a USB on the back of the computer. And then I record everything into OBS, Open Broadcast Studio, and that's free software. It's well used right across the industry by bloggers and gamers of all sorts. And uh, they wire it in for streaming live, or you can record to disc as well. It has an option of, of starting to record to disc or starting to stream out to YouTube or whatever service you've got. The challenge you've got with streaming live is that uh, you have to be prepared for that in yourself. You have to be prepared to talk and stream out your information and knowledge at the same time while you're painting or doing anything else. And that's one of the reasons I went for uh, this setup where I could switch between technology and wire different sounds in and higher quality um, cameras so that I could do that and do it live without um, having to be stopped in my flow. Um, I'm always, you know, my career is in IT and I've always been in a situation where I'm trying to sort of reduce um, friction between one particular process and another. And I really wanted to be able to zoom down here, show you perhaps a miniature or something I was working on or presenting, and then flip back to my face live without having to pre-record that in any detail. But obviously I'm pre-recording this today because it's a bit of a complex beast to uh, move between all of this equipment and explain it at the same time. But hopefully um, things are becoming clearer to you. So I wanted to tell you about the environment as well. Obviously most of us work at a normal sized desk with your computer on it. So how do you get your camera so that it's facing your face while you're working? And how would you do that um, with multiple cameras as well? It's quite a challenge really. And I uh, I was fortunate at the beginning of this year to, uh, actually beginning of last year even, to be able to set up my environment. So I had a new workbench put in here rather than a desk. And then behind there, I've got some shelving, which I can connect uh, various bits of cameras to, to enable this easy way to, to zoom down. But I'll show you the standard kit that people tend to use for this, um, which I spent a lot of time researching and finding the right bits and pieces. So I'll go back to the desktop. So what I'm going to do now basically is show you the Panasonic zooming in at various bits of the rig I've got here. So this is wired in, but it is on its wires and cables. So very likely to come disconnected which is one of the things you want to watch out for once you've got a stable environment is keep things locked in position so that you're not having to keep unplugging things all the time it's not wise to um, be yanking these things around the whole time so hopefully I can switch over so there we go so the first things uh, that I can show you at the top here is I've got my Panasonic G7 which is pointing down at the desktop and in fact there you can see as I mentioned before the flip top screen is very handy because you can see what it's focused on in that frame there and obviously the lens I can you can again you can see I can zoom that lens in and because I'm working right in front of me if I'm showing a, a model or a book or something down there I can very quickly zoom in so that is very handy to be able to do that and additionally Right in front of me here is my Hero 4. So this is a GoPro. It's it's very old. Um, I think it's about four and a half, five years old. Similar to these Panasonics as well. They're, they're about four years old, but still workhorses. Um, and you can get them cheaply secondhand on eBay. And sometimes Amazon does really good deals on them. So they are a very good entry level for uh, streaming in higher quality. And uh, yeah, so the Hero 4, it's on what's called a Manfrotto arm. So I don't know if I've got the logo visible up here. Yeah, there's sort of half the logo visible. They're Italian made, these arms, and basically enable you to 
connect up to a desk with a big bracket like this. I've got two of them here. So it's connected up to a, a metal shelf I've got in there. The bracket then connects onto that. They come as a kit. So you buy the Manfrotto arm with the kit that allows you to connect down and provides this extra mini adapter that then can be attached to a camera. So I've got it on the GoPro here, but up here they've also got the same thing connected up to the, whoops, to, you can't really see it as clearly, but round the back there I've got another Manfrotto arm and that one's connected to the Panasonic. So that's basically, yeah, I mean, it looks quite uh, technical and fiddly to do it, but it, it works for me in terms of leave that up in place. I mean, that's been up there for like a year now and working really well for me. I don't change anything. I leave all the cables connected in um, and it works well. And then in front of me here, you can see I've got a screen. We're now getting the infinite view, but I have a screen with OBS, the uh, software running on there, which allows me to basically see what's going on because my hands out here I can I can look into that view and see exactly what's going on at any time and switch between the uh, screens so if I was to now switch back to myself and uh, go to the GoPro here I am holding the camera right in front of you so I'm now getting that view directly into the screen So if you ever want to check out the YouTube channel of mine there, Rotten Lead Gaming, I have various videos on there for guides on painting models, 28mm models, Dungeons & Dragons models, and, and various miniatures like this. And I use this same setup here to do that. I'll switch between my, my muggins here and then straight down onto the desktop where I may be painting. And obviously what I haven't got on show here are all my paints and palettes and things, but I always use my brush um, to do the painting while I'm talking if I was doing a live streaming like this and then I would also potentially uh, zoom in as well so to get as close an in focus view as I can. There's various little extra tips that you can do with the Panasonic G7 which is one of them being that you can actually take a picture using the button. So midstream I've taken a photo and all it does is it freeze frames it for a moment. But there is a there's a definite benefit to be able to, to do something like that because it allows you to, um, just allows the, the viewer as well to pause it at, at the highest quality possible while streaming. Because one of the dangers of live streaming is that you'll lose frames and frames will drop depending on your dependent uh, uh, broadband and other connections locally and internationally. And uh, if you drop frames, it means it sometimes makes it a little bit hard to, for a, a user at the other end to pause the video. But if you have taken that sort of still shot, it means you're getting a few seconds of a very decent uh, stream image for someone to take a look at. So yeah, this is where I'd paint. I might show my uh, paint pots and I'd whiz through. You know, I'd show, I'd show the paint pot here. I'd talk about what the paint I was, I was going to use and then I get on with a paint job. So that's how I would do that. Um, and typically I do that on a gray base. You see beforehand I had the uh, white uh, surface in place. Now the problem with a, a white desktop is that it's very high contrast with anything you've got on there. And most cameras can't really deal with that. So as you can see around the edge here, I've got a kind of metal plate there, everything's on. Um, but having this gray color here, which I would normally use a gray piece of paper here as well, will enable me to reduce the contrast between the background and the miniature. Um, so yes, avoid having a very white sheet at the base. That's one tip I've got anyway over the years um, to avoid that very high contrasty look that the camera doesn't like. So, um, so yeah, that's how I would zoom into the models. And how would I do the role playing? Well, this is the other aspect. So if you're like me and you like a sort of pen and paper style game and some degree of theatre of the mind where your conversation with the players is just as key as the layout and environment, um, I tend to use like a map to do that um, when it gets to the point where they want combat and there's a, a, a need for that environment to be shared as in as much detail as possible. So I would do that with a pad um, if I zoom down to the desk. Um, what I've got here it's actually a very specific pad uh, written by, uh, or not written, but created by a company called uh, squarehex.co.uk. Uh, and Squarehex have a lot of the kind of BX style OSR, um, old school Renaissance games, so the early versions of D&D. &D. And this is called the Dungeon Desk Pad. And um, 
really it's not it's not specifically designed to be used live it's more of a kind of how would you create your dungeon so you might do this before you play um, so that it saves you the bother or you could as I often do is I explain things as I go on so the players might, might say you're at the doorway um, there's a, a large open door before you uh, then once they've dealt with that door they'll say okay well, well let's open the door let's open our way into the room and I might then draw the room out and then be a little bit more specific about okay there's a there's a there's a bed at this end here there's a set of stairs going up in the corner over here um, with a banister so you can climb up that way uh, there's a fireplace over this side and then lay that out with the players so that they can start to play through um, and then maybe they want to go up to the next floor so I draw out the next floor from there as well so uh, again I could, you could rulers are <laughs> optional um, but depending on how sketchy and quick I'm being they uh, the stairway will come up here as well and then the players can explore a second room with uh, something going on or maybe a balcony over this way let's draw a balcony out and some windows and say there's another exit way here or something that they can go to explore to another part of the room so yeah you can do it like that where you're just simply uh, drawing ad hoc and going um, you could actually get a bigger piece of pad than this this is as I said it's specific so it's the sort of thing where you might then go okay the bed number one there you could draw up beforehand and say okay uh, bed with um, Bed with dead, um, uh, uh, dead male, uh, green, green scum, um, oozing out of eyes. So you might be in a position where you want to do this beforehand. You might not want to show this kind of bit to the players where you're exploring. Uh, or you might want to use a bigger pad than this. But for me, this has worked out because I've quite often then done things like I've said, OK, there's maybe there's a, a few monsters in here and I will write up the monsters up in the corner here and say, you know, hit points 10, AC 15, the armor class that is, and uh, have the details there to point down the stats on those when they get hit. So number two monster. And then I would write underneath, you know, down to five hits, taking another four hits, depending on how I, I, I record that, so that the battle can ensue that way. Now, in terms of movement on there, you're saying, first of all, um, the initial thing you could do, of course, is just simply play this as it is. Um, you don't need to represent sort of the characters on there. The characters could say, yeah, I walk over to the bed. Fine, you're over at the bed. You see the man on the bed with the with the green scum oozing out of his eyes when you when you do a search or what have you, but um, there's other ways of working, and I do that with these counters. Again, I've had these for years building up because I um, have written a couple of uh, tabletop games. Um, one of them is called Grunts Fifteen Millimeter, which is a sci-fi game. The other one is Imperial Skies. Uh, both of those, while I'm in my um, playtesting mode I quite often use counters and I want numbers to reference things so I've had these made up um, and I have a, a friendly local laser cutter that charges me to have the numbers that I want uh, blasted onto the um, uh, laminated material so you've ever seen if you've ever been in any kind of plant machinery when you've been in a big warehouse or in a big factory or something quite often the electrical equipment has these um, kind of counters uh, on there or well, counters now <laughs> they just use them to label the machine it might just say you know hydro plant 10 and then a reference id underneath so who's ever um, maintaining that equipment can see the easy text on there and it's not you can't rub it off because it's the laminate it means that it's um, uh, able to be lasered in so this is a whole nother topic counters but uh, what I just really wanted to show is that what I would do is maybe have I've got different larger ones as well for bigger beasts and smaller ones like this so the players may have these where I've said to them what what number are you going to use and I'll give you a demo of those with a few character numbers oh and these ones these other counters and things I've got in there are just for games I've done so I was working on a World War One game 
and my World War One game used various conditions uh, like wonky uh, for uh, to represent. If I can get that as a moment, yeah, wonky when you couldn't do a flank move on a vehicle. Um, so anyway, that's that. And then in terms of how that would work, uh, before the start of the game, I would typically write up on the side of here that AR, the counter AR is for, let's just say Maddox, the cleric, and the counter AU is for, let's just say Wilbo, the barbarian halfling. And then as I was playing, if they came up into this room, I would typically then just say, you know, 35 is Orc 1 <laughs> and 15 Orc 2, if that's happened to be what the encounter was. And uh, as the characters move around, I would just ask them while we're online and I've got this zoomed into the map, which you could then sort of change the zoom. I'd say, where are you going? They say, oh, we're going to go upstairs. I say, OK, you come to the top of the stairs. There's two Orcs in front of you. Uh, one one of them engages you, Wilbo, and the other one engages uh, Maddox after they've rolled for initiative and done all the usual good stuff that you do there. So that really depends on how much detail you want, because if you want a layout on that where you really do show the players going through room by room in a dungeon, there's no harm in having that all pre-planned and prepared before the game. Um, because you can then just get stuck in with them and uh, allow them to tell you where they're going to move the, the, the uh, counters. And having counters of this size is obviously a little bit easier than having a large model because you need a much different scale map. I mean, I could um, zoom right out here and I could then have a much larger layout that's capable of taking miniature scale models. Um, with proper lighting and then maybe zoom in with another camera, but it's a whole lot of fuss compared to just simple counters. And you don't need to have these laser cut like I have. These could just be um, uh, paper counters and you've got standees and other things as well that you can get that could be used. But these are very small. Um, so I really like the size in terms of being able to sort of move them and the clarity of the contrast between the white text and the um, the detail on there so you really do get that feeling of uh, being able to see it clearly as a player and I say to the players before we start online I say they know what number or character um, they're going to be um, represented by and bigger monsters <laughs> I just use bigger tokens I've got a larger size than that as well and there's no rhyme or reason really for the size of these I think that's a I think it's a 30 mil 25 I'll tell you that if that matches that exactly. Yeah, that's a 30 mil round base up there. And I think these are just a centimeter and a half. Yeah, something like 13, 14 uh, millimeters on those size. And again, just a nice small size that's still also clear and readable at the same time. So there are, again, other options you can use. So I will now show off a, a package that I got from a guy in which I, I found him on Twitter, uh, on Twitter originally. And the I did do a little video at one point for them as well, but Dungeon Packs, they're by a company called Slow Quest, which is a, a single solo chap that does all these himself. And it, they contain a small adventure for use with 5th edition. Inside you find the maps, story, encounters, items, and, and tokens. And the website for this is slowquest.com. And the reason I liked it was because it did, again, facilitate this small size play really well. And these are the cards that you get in there. And I'll zoom down onto that. So again, straight away, if I was using these tokens, you can see they fit neatly on there. But the, I mean, the miniatures are nearly on there. They are 25 mil uh, size. So you could use mini minis on these as well if you wanted to. But they're really handy for, you know, a small layout when someone's done such a neat job as this. And you can see a sort of way in and way out. And you could build up, you could build up a layout of your own using these kind of cards. There's a lot of these available on, online now. I know different companies have done them, and there's no harm in doing these yourself as well. You could actually do a, um, you could do a version of this um, by printing out very similar layout of your own. You don't need to use these published ones, but they are nicely done. 
So yeah, I mean, he describes the the layout and the maze. I won't go into the detail. I just wanted to show you generally what it what it looked like. Um, and then, as a pack, the cards and details and encounters are on are included as well. So just very handy. I'm really I'm just showing off this slow quest stuff, but it is a it's a nice um, it's a nice set of um, tokens and bits and pieces. And the adventure then is a small pamphlet in there as well that you can read through and do all of the encounters. But you can see the sort of quality of the uh, materials. And then the um, little flats that come in there as well, which you can use. So um, going back to using the characters with their numbers, which I've got here, we can work our way through using those and move those on the, on the dungeon layout. Again, this is facilitation at the most sort of basic paper and token style gaming rather than using a full-on um, version of say roll 20 or something but this might be your favored way of working and uh, obviously one of the key things you can't do obviously that you can do in, in technology like roll 20 is that you'd be able to sort of hide things by using that fog of war uh, that comes with um, tools like roll 20 um, and you don't get that here, but you could re you could reveal slowly, or as I was doing earlier, you could have a sketch out of a map that you know you're going to do, and then work from there. So that's one uh, other way of using uh, products that are available already to buy is to is to look at things like this that provide you this small layout, which can be used for around a tabletop, or if you're having to do your gaming online, you can use that as well. Um, I've got one other related uh, product to show which is Axe Bane's Deck of Many Dungeons which I think I got off um, Drive Through RPG uh, print on demand cards and they are a dungeon pre-made like that now these are getting too small for my uh, little tokens but you can see the kind of layout that you get with that so you could actually use this and then draw maps from that but your my tokens are now too big as you can see to be used on there but there's no harm in being if you were going real freeform with some friends online and you didn't worry about positioning specifically so that you were more interested in the environment in general you can just keep um, randomly drawing these cards out and presenting them to the uh, players as they reveal a room even or if you wanted to you could also do this before a game so that you could pre-set up and go actually I do want that kind of layout um, so there we go so these particular um, deck of many dungeons does have encounters and bits and pieces on there so you can sort of march into a room like this one and it's got some quest ideas um, as an initial one but also other rooms like this one here it has some treasure, um, and this one, uh, which I had hidden underneath there, had a, a monster set in there, so um, it's just a roll on a dice. Let me get a dice out just to see what that comes out with when I, uh, when I roll on that. So this is the other thing handy, is to have a, a, a small tray for rolling dice as well, because I sometimes I roll the dice for the players, uh, which is handy because obviously you can't see what they're rolling unless they've got a camera focused down as well. Um, but also this is just sort of a convenient size. So if I zoom out so you can see what's going on. Yeah, it's just like a double tray when it's bolted together. You get the, uh, you get the gist that it's got a, a decent uh, rolling section as well as the uh, areas for those. So Let's get this out sorted out. And definitely one tip is to try and get everything pre-organized, which I would do and laid out specifically before you play as well, because you don't want to uh, be in the middle of a, a key flow moment in a game where they've burst into a room and there's something interesting about to happen. And then you turn around and say, Oh, just a minute, I need to get my dice tray out or something along those lines. It's much easier to sort of be pre-ready pre, pre ready with everything set up in a key position. So yeah, down here it says monsters, um, uh, zombie or drow. Let's roll a d20 and see what happens. 13, uh, two bugbears or ghouls per PC. So you can use these cards to, to drive and facilitate a full game if you're into sort of random dungeons, if, you're, if that's your bag. 
Um, but yeah, they're, they're a very handy resource again for an online style game where you want something convenient and small to be able to map something out. And as I said before, you could um, you could map out with this beforehand, take a photo, print it out, blow it up. In fact, I could probably do a layout of this on a uh, tabletop, take a decent photo with a ca uh, camera, um, and then blow it up slightly on the computer to print A4, and then I could use these counters on it, but obviously not then distribute it because that's uh, this is this person's um, creation, and this is by someone called Daniel Walthall. It says compatible with 5e, but really it's compatible with anything. So another approach you can take with mapping, which um, is kind of in the spirit of Dungeon Crawl Classics, and this is a um, it's a variety of system like Dungeon Dragons, which is slightly old school focus, but also has some very modern twists to it. It's based on uh, version sort of three or three X of D and D with uh, with its very unique flavour to it as well. But this is a module for Dungeon Crawl Classics, the game. It's called Sour Spring Hollow by Michael Curtis, and this is a level zero adventure. Um, I really like Dungeon Crawl Classics. It's a fantastic, I think it's a fantastic system, and this particular module it comes from a, a setting called Shudder Mountains by Michael Curtis. And it's the first adventure in that set. But one good thing about the whole Dungeon Crawl Classics um, as a set of rules is that so many of the uh, excellently written adventure modules have these brilliant maps where they sort of integrate um, some art with the map at the same time. So this is just one small example of that, that they're sort of showing you a side view here, bit of a spoiler, sorry. And um, also you're getting the general layout too. Now you could use, as I was saying earlier, my tokens um, on here, because these maps are so nicely done. But this is, uh, obviously it's the Games Master's map rather than the uh, player map, but it could be quickly copied and then you could you know, blank things out and photocopy it. Or if you've got the PDF version, you could edit to remove any kind of sign of things like there's a bit of a beast there. Don't look at it. Um, and a few other sort of symbols that are relative to the uh, situation. But say it's saying that one little square is five foot here, but obviously these are covering up four squares at the same time. But because these maps are so nicely done, there's no harm in you saying that you were all here. The only danger with this one, this is a level zero. Um, and those are called funnels in the DCC game and you tend to have more than one player character each in that game so you'd actually have a huge amount of tokens on here so you probably need a bigger version of this if you're going to use tokens on there or as I was saying because uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics isn't specifically focused on miniatures or tokens you can just use the layout and it gives players that nice view on a map that's within the book to save you um, uh, you know, having to draw that out yourself, and then you can just uh, use your narrative to describe um, the game as it goes on. So yeah, excellent system, Dungeon Crawl Classics, if you've not looked, at, looked it up. But at the same time, good idea again to use some published maps while you're working away as well. Hopefully they don't mind me showing this off and saying, go out and buy um, The Chained Coffin, which is this adventure is in The Chained Coffin by Dungeon Crawl Classics, and is an excellent... Uh, module for, for both for its setting, which is the Shadow Mountains, and also uh, the adventures are nicely written too. So how do you get all this stuff online then? So that's the next challenge. Um, so this is a recording I've done in OBS Studio, which I'm saving out the recording as I go, and then I'm going to uh, export that out to YouTube and Facebook so that people can view it on there as a as a pre-recorded video. However, if you were someone that was trying to stream this live and you had the role-playing game here, um, what you can do, as I mentioned before, if you've got the um, camera set up that's pointing down at your desk like this, um, because you're using the Ultra Studio Mini Recorder, everything that you um, do, if you're using this piece of technology, will look like a webcam. So if you go into Zoom, um, I think I've got Zoom loaded up on a screen here, if I go to the desktop, as an example piece of technology and let's go to desktop and you can see here that I have the zoom technology you start a new meeting this is the same as Google Hangouts um, and you can join with the computer audio and then you can also pick the video and it will it will recognize this area which I've got here as a piece of video what I can't do is right at the moment show you loading zoom 
with this screen going down here because it would try and use the same video signal that my OBS system is currently doing, um, open broadcast system, which is doing the recording. And you can't really share between a recorder and uh, that system at the same time. At least I don't think so, and I don't want to uh, risk using it at the moment. That tends to happen that I'd go into the join here and it would say, what is your, um, if I can move it along there slightly, you can see you've got video down here and you'll be able to pick the video you want to use. And there it is, Blackmagic um, Ultra Studio Mini Recorder. And all those other versions of it down there are just the different resolutions that you can use. Um, and I happen to be using it at, at HD, which is 1920 by 1080. And that's the just happens to be the resolution I've picked to, to zoom out of these cameras. Now these cameras can actually do 4K, um, but that's too heavy a uh, size format for streaming, uh, at least on my broadband setup. So I use it at this 1080p here, um, which is, as I say, 1920. And that's, again, another video session, really, is to run through all of the different settings that you can have for resolutions. But that's what I tend to use and stick to for recording anyway. So yeah, that's it. You can join with computer audio. And as I said before, that will use your USB um, mic or use the Focusrite mic that I've set up here. And then it will use the video as well from the Blackmagic device to show what's going on here whilst you're in the uh, streaming screen. Now, if you were doing anything interesting, like I mean, obviously I've got this tiny down here. If I go back to the, um, the desk and show you. And zoom down onto the desk so you could of course if you wanted your face in the frame while you're talking to people use one of these little uh, camera things here uh, you can also do some picture in picture if you if you set up the right um, uh, technology I haven't got that particularly configured at the moment um, but the view is that you could actually have the your face down in the corner as well and that's again another topic I don't have um, a green screen you can get a green screen pop-up that sits behind your desk here um, yeah so you get a green screen pop-up screen uh, a company called Elgato make them you just sit them behind your desk there and then quite easily in the OBS software I'm using here you can set it to put a mask over that so you, you choose the key color being the green background that's stacked behind you and it means just your face appears here. So when you see those um, nice videos of gamers on Xbox or PlayStation on YouTube and their face is framed by just their shoulders and head, they've got a green screen behind them. Um, so it's something I haven't invested yet. So I've got every other gadget under the sun. I just haven't got my screen screen ready yet. And at the moment with uh, the way things are with the uh, the virus situation, I've not bothered to uh, spend any more money on this in this gear because it's all uh, pre-set up and ready to go. So as a quick final note on the various services you can use, I've got uh, down here on the desk uh, another view where I can just take you through the different services. So let's just start with uh, Discord. So that will do voice, and it's mostly a voice service that are used, uh, and it's chat as well. So you can just use Discord on its own, and if you've got a mic set up, you don't need to have all this other equipment in place as well. You can just use a mic on Discord chat uh, with a set of headphones as well, and that will allow you to do role playing in there if you don't need any uh, kind of desktop environment. So Zoom, as I mentioned before, it's a it's it's a conferencing. Uh, conference tool set and the nice thing with that is that you can switch between the desktop so that you could show uh, a map or background or something on the desktop uh, plus also show the um, your uh, face if you've got a video for a webcam as well now I think you unfortunately this is stuck to 45 minutes unless you've got an account so if you know someone with an account chat to them about that um, because otherwise you are limited 45 minutes. You're never going to get a role-playing game done in that time, really. Uh, then the other one is um, obviously Skype, which some people are happy to use. That'll do screen sharing. Um, the other nice feature about Zoom, if you pay for it, that it will record your video as well. That's quite handy if you're in a session where you do want to record and you don't want to have to do that offline. Uh, Skype, you know, it's free. 
it, it works. Um, again, you can switch between the desktop and um, and you can record as well. So I haven't used Skype yet. For I've used Skype a lot at work, but I haven't used Skype when I've been doing role playing. Um, and the other service, which which I will go into in another video, is is Roll Twenty, um, and that obviously has its own voice and video. Uh, one thing I do. Um, have an issue with is that the video is like a, a postage stamp really at the bottom of your screen so you see everybody's uh, face oh that looks a bit rude gonna make that look a bit less rude um, you see everybody's face uh, in in that little postage stamp and it makes it kind of to me pointless because if we want to see someone's expression and their emotion during a game I'd like to see a slightly bigger one than that that's if you're into the um, the video aspect also um, Again, I've had some issues with uh, audio and video on Roll20. The system itself worked perfectly for showing maps and moving counters around, but we had the odd breakdown on video and voice in there. Um, yeah, the only thing I... I mean, I use Discord a lot because I'm in various chat rooms on there. The only thing I don't know about Discord is if it does video as well. It might do. Does it do video? Someone tell me. I'll have a look into it. Um, and Google Hangouts is the other one. And I haven't used Google Hangouts for a while. Um, but that works out well too. I mean, something I liked about Zoom when we when we had a game on that the other day is that uh, you could highlight one player and it say sort of stuck on one player as a games master. So if you had your map and everything in front of you, that was working on there um, and made for a great game really in terms of being able to say focused on one player, but also see reasonably sized images of the other players playing at the same time. So, yeah, I mean, this has just been a general overview. Hopefully there's been enough information there for you. And I probably need to do a Roll20 um, video like this as well, where I actually show it in action and show how I play that through. Um, but I'll have to set that all up. I thought I'd start with some of this technology. Again, you may notice I haven't dived into every piece of technology. I've got Stream Decks here with these icons on, which I use over this side. I've got various uh, sound... Uh, type effects which you can then even like if you were really inclined you could even do some music or something on there and get some instruments going and um, it's handy sometimes for a little intermission or something a little bit spooky while you're while you're talking through as they enter into a room to give it some ambience as well or if they're on the dock side suddenly and uh, you want to just uh, highlight there's a few seagulls in the air so Something like these kind of bits of technology do help facilitate some interest in gaming, but uh, I will dive into that tech in another video because this is going to go on too long for now. So great, thanks. So signing off then. Really appreciate you um, joining and viewing this video. As you can see over here, this is my YouTube channel. I'm probably streaming this onto um, or uploading this onto Facebook as well. So wherever you see it, I'd appreciate it if you went and, and gave me a like or also had a, had a look over on my channel, uh, which I'm trying to uh, focus on for some more video content like this. And also just pile in the questions into the uh, comments thread as well, because I can then answer. Or if you said, well, hang on a minute, what's that thing you used to make the sounds and how did that work? Or, or you used a really rubbish system there um, because you know a lot more about something than I do. Um, dive in there with questions and I'll hopefully I'll be able to answer them. So thanks very much for listening in and goodbye.